Okay. Great. Good morning, everyone. Bless Thursday. Uh, uh, Deputy Borough President Jenna Pegueto, so excited about today's agenda. We have a jam-packed agenda um, and we will be ha hosting our budget hearing. So we're super excited about today's Borough Hall. Um, so we'll begin. Good morning, everyone. Pursuant to Chapter 4, Section 85 and Chapter 61, Section 2706 of the, of the New York City Charter, a joint meeting of the Bronx Borough Service Cabinet and Bronx Borough Board will take place today. Thursday, February 24th, uh, 2022, starting now 10 a.m. and vir virtually on via WebEx. Thank you everyone for joining. We'll begin roll call. I'll start with community boards followed by city council representatives, uh, starting with community board one. Okay, CB2. Good morning, Madam Deputy. Ralph Acevedo, District Manager. Good morning, everyone. Ralph. CB3. Good morning, Mr. Frederick Crawford, uh, Chair of Committee Board Number 3. Good morning, Chair. CB4. CB5. Good morning, Deputy Borough President. This is Ken Brown, District Manager of Board 5. And I believe our Chair Dr. Bola is on also. Good morning. Uh, yes, good morning, uh, Dr. Good Bola. Good morning. CB6. CB7. CB8. Laura, I know you're there. I um, I just had muted. Uh, just as a reminder of everybody, can keep their mics on mute unless they're actively speaking. Oh, just I I thought I was unmuted. And also, Kira. My, Hi, good just... morning. It's Kira Gannon, District Manager, Bronx Community Board Eight. Good morning, CB Nine. CB Ten. Morning, Peter Cantillo, Second Vice Chairman. Morning, CB eleven. Good morning, Kevin Board Coordinator Chris Kirk. Good morning, Borough President. CB twelve. Good morning, Madam Deputy. This is Dr. Michael Burke, Chairman, Community Board twelve. Good morning. Hi. Good morning, George Torres, Community Board twelve. Good morning, George. And Arlene Parks from CB one is logged on. Um, I think we may have just added her to the meeting just after that part of the roll call. Just acknowledging that she's. She is here. Good morning, Chair. Thank you for joining. All righty, we'll move to City Council representatives. We'll start with Madam uh, Deputy Speaker uh, Sia Mayala. Good morning, Jose Rodriguez, Chief of Staff, to Council Member, Deputy Speaker Sia Mayala. Good morning, Jose. Uh, CM Dinowitz. CM Riley. CM Velasquez. Hi everyone, Adrian here from Councilmember Marjorie Velasquez's office. CM Sanchez. Sam here, uh, Chief of Staff for Councilmember Sanchez. Morning. CM Feliz. CM Stevens. Good morning, Kate Conley here from Chief of Staff for Councilmember Althea Stevens. CM Salamanca. Hi, good morning, Shannon Knox, Deputy Chief of Staff for Councilmember Salamanca. CM Farias. Great, wonderful. Again, thank you all so much for joining on this blessed Thursday. We have a jam packed agenda. We have some uh, uh, great representatives from the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection and a representative from Bronx Impact. And uh, our, our agenda will follow uh, announcements, BP announcements, and then we will transition over to the public budget hearing to follow. So feel free to uh, stick around for, for the budget hearing. But again, for folks that unfortunately do have to hop off, 
This will be recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel. So feel free to tune in uh, via, via the web. Um, but we are excited to present, uh, Mar let me just really quickly check in with my colleagues. Marisol, are the folks from DWCP on? I, I do not see them on, but I do see representatives from Community Board 4 and Community Board 9. Um, you have Paul Phillips from the district manager and you have Shirley Alonso from CB9. Great. Wonderful. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining. Are we set with our presenter from Bronx Impact? We can start with Bronx Impact. Bronx Impact is here. Wonderful. We are joined by Naisia Manin from Bronx Impact, and she will provide us with an overview of the resources and services being delivered through the organization in uh, coalition and in partnership with Children's Aid Society. Naisia, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Good morning. I'm Nyasia Manning. I'm the program manager for My Bronx Impact. Uh, I'm here with our senior director of Bronx Impact, uh, Rose DeStefano. I don't know if she's here. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Oh. Um, um, Nyasia, I know you have a deck that you wanted to share. Is that, are you able to pull that up? So yeah, if you hit the uh, share icon at the bottom in the middle, middle bottom middle, sorry, of WebEx, uh, you should have the option to share either your whole screen or just the app, and that's coming up right now. Perfect. Cool. Um, well, I, I'll kick this off and I'll pass it over to Nyasia. Um, thank you so much, uh, Deputy Borough President um, Piguero. It's really great to be here. We're super grateful and to all of the community boards and council members as well. Thank you so much for the, the time. I'll speak very quickly um, and I'll pass it over to Nyasia who runs the My Bronx Impact work. Um, I'm Rosa Stefano. I'm the Senior Director of Collective Impact at Children's Aid. Our work at Bronx Impact, which is one of our initiatives, is to transform structural systems through a partnership of collective impact teams that are working with residents and cross-sector stakeholders. And we do that to develop hyper-local solutions around food, education, open space, workforce development, economic development, um, always starting with the communities, connecting with partners and leaders, and then building solutions together. Um, we have three different projects. We have the Bronx Impact Alliance, which um, I'll show you in a moment where all of these are located across the Bronx, but these are backbone teams that are specifically located in community districts three, six, and nine, um, working on hyperlocal solutions. And then we've got the Jerome Avenue Revitalization Collaborative, which is focused on the West Bronx um, around addressing the impact of the rezoning. And then today you'll learn a lot more about my.bronximpact.org. Um, so I'll save that for Naisha. You go to the next slide. Yeah, thank you. So uh, this is geographically where we're placed. We've got um, three, six, and nine, and then we've got four and five. And you'll see there's also a blue line around the entire Bronx. And that is the focus of my.bronximpact.org's area. So um, I'll pass it over to Naisha to share about the tool, but I'll also put my email address um, and name into the chat in case anyone wants to learn more. Thank you so much. Go ahead, Naisha. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, so my.bronximpact.org um, is the one of the three parts of the Bronx Impact Initiative. Um, our initiative um, kind of started, we spent a year talking to uh, Bronx community leaders and, and residents, um, over 100. And one thing that came back was, uh, we want one place where we can find all the resources around us. Um, and so we ended up creating uh, this online resource guide um, called my.bronximpact.org. Um, very similar to if you've ever used uh, Yelp or ZocDoc, um, but for social services. Um, so you can type in your zip code um, and you can find any category need that you're looking for free or reduced cost services. So anything from medical care to like programs that help you 
find jobs or diapers and formula um, you can find on our site. Um, and it's the only dual facing um, site like this, um, which means that residents can go on our site to find services, um, but also community based organizations, those people who provide those services um, can, you know, advertise their supports um, and respond to the referrals uh, that they receive uh, through our site. Um, so what specifically does our team do? Um, we work with community leaders to improve access to social care um, because we believe great networks build trust over time. Um, and our goal really is just to support community based organizations um, and other community leaders who provide um, or who work to, to refer uh, residents to social social services um, and make sure that the residents are getting the supports that they need um, and that we're bringing um, dignity and ease to this whole process of navigating social services. Um, so right now, um, it's really hard. If you're not super tuned into the community, it's really hard for you, for someone to directly connect to a program or know where to look for a program or a service. Um, so with our site, we try to streamline that connection um, from the seeker or the resident or whoever's you know, looking for a service directly to the program. Um, so they can go on our site, they can search by the zip code, um, browse for whatever service they're looking for, and then through our site, they can directly connect uh, to that program. And um, so our, our program has been live since uh, 2019, uh, but especially during COVID is really when it became really popular, obviously, because people were trying to figure out, you know, what uh, places are still open, how um, are they going to get those services now that they are closed. Um, so over the last um, two years, you can kind of see uh, some of the impact we've had um, on the Bronx. We've um, had over 1,300 residents uh, connected to a service. Um, we have over 3,000 programs claimed on our site. Um, over 20,000 searches um, have happened. Um, we've been able to train 115 community leaders. Um, some of those include uh, elected official offices. Um, we've completed 102 referrals through our site. Um, yeah, so we've been, we're really excited about the impact we've had on the, uh, on the Bronx. Um, and something that some of you might be familiar with is every uh, month we send out these data reports, um, based on, uh, for community boards, but also for some elected official offices. Um, we share these data reports, um, every month, um, and they kind of give a highlight overview of what, ha what's happening, um, in your district or in your service area. Um, so what I'm showing you guys right now is what's happening um, on our site in the Bronx as a whole, what people in the Bronx are looking for. Um, so you can see we've had in the month of January, we had 327 residents from the Bronx using our site. Um, over uh, about 20% of those um, searches on our site in the month of January were for food and housing. Um, and we had, uh, 595 searches that month, um, around these categories, um, of need. Um, you can see what the most popular zip codes on our site are. Um, and then you can kind of see what the most common search terms is. So what, what are people, uh, typing in when they're looking for services on our site? Um, there's big, uh, the number one search term is food pantry, um, there's searches for job placement, um, again, helping to find housing, people looking for baby clothes um, and helping to pay for utilities. Um, we have some searches for bus passes, um, helping to pay for internet or phones, um, mental health care, and some specialized training um, searches happening. So people who are looking for um, supports with uh, like, uh, if they're looking for like 
uh, how do you say, like trainings in a specific type of field, um, people are looking for those searches as well. Um, I think in terms of specialized training, it's probably um, the last time I looked at it, it was referring to like construction work training. Um, so I think that's probably where that's coming from. Um, yeah, so this is what our, I actually want to switch over to show you guys a little bit about what our site looks like. Um, but does anyone have any questions just about the, the data reports that we share um, before I just show you really quickly what a search looks like on our site? Nisha, I had a quick question. Um, with the data, I know that uh, Bronx Impact has done an amazing job and, and thank you so much for, for your service and your work. Um, who, who else, I know that there's a coalition, but what are the uh, your key partners in terms of delivering services, who are you connecting with predominantly when it comes to um, the food and security issues and the job training opportunities? Um, so we work with JARC in terms of the job training opportunities, okay. Jerome Avenue Revitalization yeah. Collaborative. Um, and we don't specifically have like a uh, certain people that we partner with for certain uh issues or needs in the community um we do have like an open pilot program so organizations can join us and okay. they provide various services um so that's kind of how we uh work and partner with the community can i also add you know that really like the purpose of the site is to have one place where all of the resources exist in the Bronx. And so, you know, one of the things that we can see is if people are looking for something and that service doesn't exist in the area, our site actually can help us to produce a, like a gaps report. Right. Um, and so we have, you know, we've noticed that in a certain area, lots of people are searching for food and there's not a lot of food pantries or, um, you know, maybe there are people that serve that area, but they're not serving the, you know, they need to be bolstering their activity in that area. And we, we can reach out to those organizations and let them know um, this is this is a need that we're seeing. Uh, I think the for the majority, like the the purpose of this site is really to help you all, the community boards and ourselves to understand what are the resources and how can we get those to people very quickly. Um, and, and like the strategy part, I think around that is um, something that Nyasha's team also does as well, but, but to a lesser extent of like the collating work. Any Nyasha. other questions before I hop into? Really quickly, I just wanted to acknowledge, um, I see Lorenzo from CN, uh, CM Dinowitz office. Thank you for joining. And Chris, there there's some hands that are raised. Yes, yeah, uh, so let's see, Ken, Ken had his hand raised first, I believe. Ken Brown, go ahead. Oh, thank you, Chris. Thank you, uh, Deputy Borough President. Naisha Rose, thank you. Good to see you as always. Um, because you guys have been a uh, fundamental partner through JARC. I remember back uh, when Bronx Impact was a glint in the eye uh, at the um, Center for Bronx Nonprofits. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, or for you to talk, sorry, a little bit about the relationship of Bronx Impact with um, the Center for Bronx Nonprofits. You mentioned that there's a GAPS survey. So I was wondering how that gap survey information is coordinated or associated with the Center for Bronx Nonprofits in terms of building capacity in the borough. Um, so one of the ways we work with Center for Bronx Nonprofits, um, they also have a kind of a listserv or resource guide. Um, their resources are strictly for uh, like uh, services for community based organizations, whereas we are services for um, the individuals in the community. Um, but we work with them. Uh, a lot of the services that they do have, or some of the services that they do have and the organizations that they do have on their um, list. 
um, are also added onto ours to kind of uh, fill some of the gaps that um, we might have mm -hmm. um, on our site. Yeah, we did a review with them, uh, must have been late last year, and I think they had a list of somewhere around like 700 nonprofits that they that they have on their list. We have about 4,000 nonprofits on our list, so um, we, we sort of agreed also just with the tech functionality that My Bronx Impact has that I know Naish is about to share, uh, that you know anything that we can bring on to our site from the Center for Bronx Nonprofits um could only help to to like more fully flesh out a singular list um in addition we've been talking with center for brown Bronx nonprofits because they do great ta work with um community-based organizations so we've been talking about this idea of like potentially having them train some of the nonprofits that are in their sector report those seven or eight hundred uh, to actually start using my dot Bronx impact. And um, as Nyasia mentioned, it's, it's dual facing. So it's both resident facing and it's community facing. There's like tools for the um, organizations to figure out their referral systems, and things like that. So. All right, I see George Torres has his hand raised as well. George, you can unmute and go ahead. Hey, how you doing? Thank you. Okay, I think I'm on both. Hold on. One second, George. Uh, you should be back. Okay, thank you. I couldn't unmute myself from the computer. Um, oh, I'm not having a disco. Hold on one second. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm curious because um, I was going to ask where your funding comes from. Um, I work for the city. I love working for the city. I've been with the city for a very long time. It seems like you're duplicating services that 311 already has. Um, I mean, that's the whole point of 311 is to look at the numbers and report out to the city or to the rest of the agencies if they're doing the job that they're supposed to be doing and filling in the gaps. Now, I know that that doesn't happen, but I guess maybe I should have thought of it. Is this information that you're providing the gap, whatever it is, for the nonprofits that you deal with so that they're filling the services? I mean, who is this directed at? Um, I'll jump in, Naisha. So a, a couple of points you just brought up. We work with nonprofits to let them know, like, hey, there we need more services in this given area. More often, we're working with folks who are at the city council office or at community boards um, who are like share have a shared mutual interest in making sure that the people in that neighborhood get the services that they need. Um, the audiences, yeah, there's really three audiences. It's like the residents, it's nonprofits who, you know, if I'm working at a housing nonprofit and my client, is talking to me about a job that they're, you know, or, or job training potential. That also, this tool equips me as a housing person to also offer information outside of my area of scope. Um, and then, yeah, working similarly with, with groups that are on this call today as well. Um, in terms of the, I definitely hear you on the 311 overlap and I, I know, Naisha, you can speak a little bit more about this. You know, what we know and believe, one of the th things that we learned in our listening tour is that um, there needs to be a level of trust that's built into the referrals and the types of services that people are being are being sent to. And so Naisha mentioned, you know, claimed programs. What does that mean? There's all these programs that are on our site, but then we have programs that are claimed. That's the equivalent, you know, on Yelp when there's, you know, a business can claim the business and then you know that that information's accurate. You know that that's, you know, that restaurant, they are the ones who put in their hours of operation um, and they're the ones who are essentially running and overseeing the content of that, that part of Yelp. Similarly, for My Bronx Impact nonprofits that are listed, you can claim your card your program card and it 
it makes it so that if I'm a, a resident and I'm looking for a service and I can click on something, I'm not just clicking on a box that gives me information about a service. I'm, I'm clicking on a button that actually connects me to a person at that other organization. So I would say that's probably the main distinction between 311 and My Bronx Impact is that we're we're trying to build out like not just a list of services, but a list of trusted resources um, that help to reduce some of the um, the challenges that residents experience when they're looking for support. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Great question. Um, okay, so I am gonna hop really quickly in just to show you guys what it looks like on our side, what it looks like to connect to a service um, on our site. Um, does someone wanna give me a zip code that we can work with? 10453. 10453. Cool. Um, so ideally someone would come in, they type in the their zip code and they're going to see this page that shows them that there are over 3000 programs that serve people in that zip code. So what that means is that includes programs uh, nationwide programs all the way down to the local programs, you know, across the street from them. Um, they can translate the site into over 100 languages. Um, and then they can choose a category. Um, and find a service that they are looking for. Um, so really popular right now is housing in the Bronx. Um, so I'm just gonna go there. They can find services that help them find housing, pay for housing. Um, there's other kinds of housing advice, um, programs, et cetera, that they can find. They can click it there. and it will take them to a list of um, programs. Um, so first off, they can filter um, the programs out um, about themselves, um, or they can filter out by the actual program or their income eligibility, if there's a program that has that um, distinction in it. Um, but then everyone will see this program card. Um, on the right of the program card, you'll see like a little blue check. That means that that program is claimed. Um, and that means that when they refer themselves, that means uh, it's kind of like being verified on Twitter. Um, that person knows that when they make a referral to this program, um, it'll go directly to that program manager or that program director, or whoever is in charge of, you know, responding to referrals at that specific program. All of the programs on our site all of the services on our site are listed by program first and organization second. Um, and that's because, you know, no one is going to be like, I want a children's aid program. They're going to be like, I need a daycare. Right. Um, and we want to make sure they're correcting directly to the exact service that they need um, rather than to like a large organization that they would have to, you know, filter through to get to um, a specific service. Um, so on the program cards, um, they can click more info just to learn a little bit about what other services that organization provides, um, who they serve. Um, if there are any eligibility requirements, it's listed here. Um, you can even see when the last time a program on our site was updated. Um, this one was last updated by the organization um, on November 9th, 2021. Um, and then if they had multiple locations, um, you would be able to see it on this program card. Um, but the really cool thing is if they decide that this is the program for them, they can refer themselves directly to that organization. Um, if you're a case manager, you can refer your client directly to this organization. Um, you would just put in the relevant information. Um, you would put in uh, that person's um, preferred method of contact. So um, email, text message, or phone call, or don't reach out for um, people who are in domestic violence situations and maybe their phones or emails are compromised. Um, so that organization knows not to um, call that person or email that person and that person will reach out to them first. Um, 
you can you you get confirmed consent um, from that person, and then when you hit send, this um, referral will go straight to uh, this program, um, and they will receive an email um, with that person's name, their contact information, um, and they'll be able to either you know call them or email them or text them and say, hey, we received your referral. Um, maybe they'll say, we need a little bit more information from you. Um, but this way you can track the status of the referral the entire way through. Um, and that organization can also um, track the status of that referral um, the entire way through as well. So that's what it looks like on our site. Um, there's a bunch of cool tools you can use. It is a resource guide and you can, um, one of the pros is that you can, when you create an account, you can also create an internal resource guide um, on the site um, by saving um, some organizations that you're really interested in, sharing them, um, and there are, are various other things uh, or tools that you have access to um, on the site when you, when you create an account. Um, but you don't need to create an account to um, connect to a program or to search anything on the site. Okay. I think uh, we have some some hands raised. We'll take another minute or so to to take one or two more questions. Sure. Yeah. I saw, uh, Arlene Parks, your hand is raised. Go ahead and unmute. Hi, this is Arlene Parks. Thank you. Uh, I just would like information, contact information for the organization so that uh, we can have uh, your uh, company come and make a presentation before community board one with this, you know, to inform our board members regarding the services that are available uh, that your organization can connect our residents to. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other questions? I know some were answered in the chat. Yeah, I don't see any other hands raised at this time. Thank you so much, Bronx Impact, for all your work and uh, your detailed presentation. I'll be interested, and, and I'm sure other folks on this call as well, uh, such as your NEETS report, um, kind of also sharing the GAPS report. That way we know, you know, how how to support local organizations to to ensure that, you know, the the real needs are being met. So if if that's something that's possible to obtain, um, mm -hmm. that GAPS report might be super important for folks on the call as well. Great. Well, it was great talking to everyone. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me to speak here. Um, we're really trying to get out in the community now. Yes. Um, so if you guys are holding, you know, any you know resource fairs or things that we can table at, um, we'd love to be out there um, putting our face, putting a face to the name so that residents. Um, Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. No, we are super appreciative of your work and, and thank you for being on and presenting. Um, up next, we have a representative from the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection, Deputy Director of Community Affairs. Yes, hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Awesome. Thank you so much for having us. Uh, my name is Ayad. I'm from the, uh, the Department of Consumer Worker Protection. Um, I would like to thank you for having us today. And, uh, you know, I just want to give an overview of uh, who we are as a city agency. I think I know uh, I see familiar faces on here and I have been presenting on these topics um, all over. But um, since we are on tax season, um, I want to dedicate this, you know, in the next 10 or 15 minutes, just really, um, you know, to share why it's important to connect folks to the uh, free tax prep uh, that the city have. 
Um, so before I do that, just a quick background. DCWP, we were uh, formerly known as the Department of Consumer Affairs. Uh, we protect and enhance the daily economic lives of New Yorkers to create thriving communities. And we do that um, or this uh, through uh, three primary uh, activities. Uh, we license over 59,000 businesses in more than 50 uh, industries. We enforce uh, consumer protection uh, as well as licensing and weight and measure laws. Uh, meditates uh, complaints between consumers and businesses. We also pursues, um, pursue um, high impact litigation to target unfair business uh, practices across the city. Um, and most importantly, we uh, safeguard um, workers' rights, such as the paid sick leave, commuter benefits, uh, freelancer is in free act, uh, the paid care worker protections, and most recently, which we're very excited to be enforcing and overseeing the delivery workers' protection laws that came uh, recently. Um, and that's through the Office of Labor Policy and Standards, um, OLPS. Um, and lastly, we also promote financial health in our city through the Office of Financial Empowerment, um, OFE. Um, and we do that because communities, uh, uh, we, uh, it's, it's one of the first local government initiatives of its kind, really. Um, and OFE uh, focuses on initiatives um, that support New Yorker uh, communities with low income and building assets and improving fi their financial health. Um, and we, we do that through like the uh, financial empowerment centers and also the tax, a free tax preparation centers across the, uh, New York City. Um, and this program could be instrumental to help in individuals who live and work in New York City. Uh, and the centers uh, provide free one on one professional and confidential financial counseling to support um, individuals reaching their financial goals. Uh, the counselors can help uh, them manage and budget their money, improve their credit, find safe and affordable banking products, and navigate student loan debt. Uh, and much more. And, uh, you know, we're very excited to have that program and uh, please connect your constituents and your folks to this, um, the financial or office of, uh, financial empowerment. Lastly, the NYC free tax prep, uh, which is under our, uh, OFE program, um, uh, center. Um, a per, uh, the, uh, NYC free tax prep program, um, offers New Yorkers the chance to file their taxes for, uh, for free. And it's by IRS certified um, volunteer tax providers on, um, online or in person. And we do that through, um, uh, you know, uh, our, our centers um, across the city. And there's four ways to file uh, taxes this year. Um, and, uh, you know, you could do in person where you could connect uh, filers to a knowledgeable IRS certified volunteers to, uh, to prepare and help complete an accurate tax return. Um, and you could also do a drop off service where you uh, drop off your tax document. And I know the deputy bear president joined us uh, a few weeks ago in the Bronx when we launched this. So thank you again for coming and, uh, you know, for your support. And so we do also a drop off service where you allow, which allows you to drop off your tax document and pick up the completed tax return. Um, and we also do virtual tax prep um, and uh, where you have access to, um, to do it while uh, you're at home. Um, and we also have self uh, self prep with help, which means that you could do your own taxes, um, uh, you know, but with someone's help on the side. Um, so New Yorkers who fall within the in income guidelines earning seventy two thousand dollars or less for families, and also fifty thousand uh, dollars or less for individuals in twenty twenty one. So those are eligible folks to, uh, you know, um, be eligible to the program. And so this year, especially, and why it's important, the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021 oh. made several changes, um, tax credit substantially more generous uh, for tax uh, for the tax year of 2021. And these include the child tax credit, earned income tax credit, and the child and uh, dependent care credit. Um, so it's important to connect uh, and help, uh, you know, um, connect uh, New Yorkers, especially in the Bronx, please, because 
Um, we have, uh, uh, you know, a low turnout in the Bronx um, for this uh, city initiative. So please connect your individual, uh, you know, your constituents to this program. And you could do that by visiting our website, nyc.gov slash tax prep or call 311 um, and say tax prep and you will be connected uh, to this program uh, through our providers. I know Bronx works. Uh, Ariva in the Bronx, MMCC also, they are some of our providers, so feel free to connect with them. And if, of course, this is uh, also offered in many different languages, English, Spanish, Arabic, Bengali, Chinese, and much more. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. And if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you so much, Ayad, for that valuable information, especially on the tax um, preparation piece. Uh, three important new credits and opportunities uh, for, for a larger refund, especially during these times as we work towards recovery. Um, I see some hands up. Right, Chris. I see George Torres has his hand raised. Yes. George, go ahead. Hey, thanks. Ayad, what's up, man? Um, quick question. Why is the, I checked out your website uh, for the free tax prep. Why are there different, I guess, income maxes or limits that are required? Like some say 58,000, others say 70. Can you explain that discrepancy? Sorry, where do you see that, uh, George? Is it with our providers or through our? Yeah. Okay. So you have a website. I think you could do it by zip code or something like that. And it right. gives you a map of the Bronx. And then it says, I, you know, I'm assuming, let's just say Ariva is one of the tax preparers. It'll say that there's an income limit. Um, so if you make more than that, then it's not free. Um, but that number seems to be different from provider to provider. Sure. So, yes, um, I know who, uh, what you're referring to, and that's with regards to the earned income tax credit, uh, which, uh, you know, the income limits for the EITC were uh, expanded tax uh, in in uh, last year, and so this um, you know means that for single and married uh, people who are eligible if they worked full or part time at some point during 2021, um, but that doesn't mean uh, that they are not eligible to file for free. Um, what really means is that earned less than 21,000, I believe, for single filers with no dependents and also um, up to $57,000 for, um, you know, married couples. Um, but if there's, uh, if they're being denied the service, uh, you know, if they're qualified, you know, they make, if they're single filers and making $50,000 or less and they're being denied, um, that shouldn't be the case. But th it's a, it, that's being referred to the uh, earned income tax credit. It's not referred to the overall eligibility of the program. And also, I just wanted to include, I'm going to share a link um, on here on the chat where offices, including community boards and community organizations could order um, some of our flyers, the, uh, you know, literature for the, uh, it comes in many different languages. So you could put an order in this Google form and then we'll make sure that it's, it's being delivered to you. So you could hand out and have in your office, you know, uh, to give to your constituents. I just shared it. Thank you. And deputy, I don't see any other hands raised at this time. Great. Ayad, and I know that uh, the WCP has a, a, a very great, um, you guys have like a, a marketing um, flyer regarding the three tax credits and, and again, the eligibility for free um, tax pre preparation services. So if, if the WCP can share that widely with the community boards and, and the council, member uh, representatives, I think that would be super helpful. I know it's translated in English and Spanish, um, and I think it, it, it hits the, the nail on the head and, and makes it very clear kind of like the uh, the registration and the different ways to, to file your taxes. So if, if you, if, if the agency can share that, I think that would be super helpful. Yes, uh, I could share that. In the meantime, um, you know, it does, we, we do have an updated uh, literature 
Uh, it comes in like a, a booklet. I don't have a copy on me, but it comes like a booklet with many different languages. Um, and it explains everything about the NYC free tax credit as well as the child tax credit, earned income tax credit, and the dependent uh, care uh, tax credit as well. And I'll be dropping the link to the PDF um, on the chat as well. Thank you so much. I don't see any other questions. Really quickly before we move into announcements, I just want to acknowledge uh, other city agencies that may be on the call. Hey, this is Orlando Torres from the New York City Commission on Human Rights. Good morning. Good morning. Michael Sharp, Department of Finance. Good morning, F.E. Artisoni, D.P. Good morning, Valerie Davis O'Neill, New York City Parks, Bronx Borough Commissioner's Office. Good morning, Jocelyn Bennett, Department of Social Services. Good morning, Brian Pargnoli, New York City Emergency Management. Good morning, Sanitation Department, Jason Sam from the Community Affairs. From DOT. Well, thank you all so much. Any announcements from the city agencies be before we move on to ours? Uh, Michael Sharp from Finance, as he has his hand raised. Michael, go ahead. Uh, good morning to all. Um, just want to remind uh, the community boards and all present uh, elected officials that the deadline to apply for property tax exemptions is March 15th, 2022. Also, if you're looking to challenge uh, your market value or your assessed value. You live in a, a class one property. That is also March 15th. Um, also, if any, any of you or those in your community boards, if they are a part of the rent freeze program, please remind individuals that they must renew their program, uh, their application each time they sign the lease. And there has been a pause put on revoking that benefit through the pandemic but that revoking will, that pause will sunset at some point and at that you are required, whether you get a letter to say you are revoked or not, you are required to uh, provide the uh, renewed application. You'll be hearing from us. There are letters that are going out, but please be proactive in helping these uh, seniors to apply for the benefit. We don't want them to end up with a situation where their rent goes up suddenly or they have arrears. So our property tax exemptions and the rent freeze are the two announcements that I'd like to make. And everyone have a, a good day. Thank you, Michael. Um, I see Brian from Emergency Management also has a hand raised. Brian, go ahead. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, we have uh, a few updates. Um, we are seeking uh, New York City high school students to participate in the inaugural hurricane program. Uh, design, it's designed to encourage young women in grades 9 through 12 to pursue uh, careers in leadership roles in emergency management. Uh, the program is offered by the Institute of Diversity and Inclusion in Emergency Management and consists of a week-long camp that includes both lectures and hands-on activities focused on emergency management and personal development. There's no cost for students to participate in the program. We have more information on that on our website. Uh, and the uh, all all applications are due by March 8th, uh, 2022. Um, we also have uh, applications open for our John D. Solomon Fellowship. Uh, those are due March 21st at midnight, and that program uh, allows for 10 graduate students in the New York City area with the opportunity to uh, complete a nine month paid fellowship in an agency of the New York City government or a nonprofit organization. And you can find more information uh, on myc.gov slash John D. Solomon Fellowship. And I'll follow up with just some of our general tips after this, but I also wanna note that uh, Mayor Adams has appointed uh, Zach Eichel to be the Commissioner of Emergency Management and uh, he started this week. And if there's any questions, I'm happy to take them. Uh, I don't see any questions. Uh, do you see Effie from DEP has her hand raised? Hi, Effie, go good ahead. morning. 
Um, here at DEP, um, in partnership with New York State, we're offering a low income household water assistance. It's a program through which eligible homeowners can receive up to $5,000 to resolve overdue water bills. I've sent out the link and I'll also attach it here on the chat. If anyone is interested, customers have to apply for this program. Um, so definitely please share it with your constituents. As well, um, DEP is hosting a green infrastructure grant program workshop on Wednesday, March 9th, 2 to 3.30. Attendees can learn about funding available for green roof retrofits on private property, what the eligibility requirements are and how to apply. I'll also include that in the chat. Thank you. All right, and I see Ken Brown from uh, CB5 has his hand raised. Ken, go ahead. Thank you, Chris. Uh, good morning, Effie. Um, we had our general board meeting last night, and there was some interest expressed about the, um, I forget how you phrased it, the loud muffler uh, notification uh, pilot. Yeah, right. could you talk a little bit more about that? Where is it going to be piloted, and how do we get it into our board? So, um, yesterday, uh, we announced this is a pilot program in its initial infant stages. Um, and it's meant to include the use of roadside sound meters and a camera to capture evidence of vehicles that are emitting noise that's in violation of the recent New York state vehicle and traffic law. Um, we don't, I don't have a lot of information on the program because right now it's only based on one camera in Queens. Um, yeah. And uh, there is an issue where I believe the camera cannot be placed on two lane traffic. Um, it has to capture the car that is causing the problem and not the car driving next to it, for example. So we're still trying to figure out the details um, and we should be having some more information in, in the coming months, which I will definitely share with all of you. Penalties were issued um, on this pilot camera that we have in Queens, and we are also going to see how these summonses are adjudicated. Um, so there is a lot of um, things that are being worked out on. Um, and I will definitely keep you posted as I have more information, but I did share that press release with everyone so you have a general sense of what we're working on. Thanks, Effie. And uh, just for the record, CB5 asked for it first, hey. <laughs> Thank you. I have definitely received a lot of interest for this program. Um, so I'm, I'm keeping tabs on everybody who's contacting me about it. Thank you. Thanks, Effie. All right, Deputy, I don't see any other hands raised at this time. Wonderful. Uh, really quickly on our end, um, brief announcements. Just a reminder, tomorrow is our Black History event. Um, it will be hosted at Maestro's at 530. If you're interested, please reach out to our offices. Everyone is invited, um, but really excited about our Black History event uh, tomorrow. Um, just a reminder to, to all, um, as, as many of you may know, community board applications, uh, the March 4th deadline is uh, fastly approaching. Um, so please encourage uh, folks to, to apply and, and join our uh, dynamic, diverse community boards. Um, addition, additionally, for the month of March, our Women's History, Her uh, uh, History event um, it's scheduled for March 10th at the New York Botanical Gardens at 530. Again, if you're interested in, in joining us in celebration, uh, please, uh, we would love to see you there. Um, and just a, a reminder, our next uh, borough board meeting will be scheduled for March 17th. Same time, same place, but really looking forward to one day being um, in the same room uh, with, with all of you uh, and leading these uh meetings in person, uh, hopefully in, in the near future. Um, and up next, we have our, our budget hearing. So we will be opening up the platform for folks uh, to offer uh, public testimony. Before I go ahead, I just wanted to turn it to my colleagues, see if there's anything else um, that, we, uh, that we've missed. 
Marisol, Tom, Chris. Uh, as far as raised hands or anything, I believe we're all set. Um, Marisol and Tom, let us know. Um, I do think it'd be good to just, once we're ready to start the public hearing on the budget, um, to just touch on some of the WebEx, you know, info uh, for attendees for the hearing. Wonderful. Um, Chris, let me know when you open it up. And so I'll read the, the charter. Sure. Um, so, yeah, it's, we, we do have some people connecting now. Um, okay. Let's say um, if you want to read the charter uh, part first and then Wonderful. Uh, just go over how to, you know, raise your hand in WebEx for anyone who's connected over the next couple of minutes so that uh, if they need to speak, they have the ability to do so. Wonderful. So just really quickly, thank you all again for joining us this morning. Um, we will open up the platform for the budget hearing and public testimony pursuant to section uh, 241 of the New York City Charter, Bronx City Charter, Bronx Borough President Vanessa L. Gibson will host the Bronx Borough Board public hearing on the mayor's preliminary budget for fiscal year 2023 and the capital and service needs of the borough on Thursday, February 24th at, at 11 a.m. 11 a.m. virtually via WebEx. Thank you, Chris, if you can just go over. Sure. Yeah, so um, I think most people who are connected have been with us on WebEx before uh, in, in some capacity, but just for everyone who's an attendee, um, you can raise your hand if you're connected on a computer, smartphone, or tablet. You can use the raise hand button in the WebEx software. If you're connected by phone, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine. Um, and when do you raise your hand uh, we'll, we'll be monitoring that uh, and allowing people to speak one at a time. So uh, I will be keeping an eye on that. And Deputy Borough President Peguero will, uh, you know, will be running the hearing. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, up first, we have Robin and Sandy from Lehman College. Betty, do you know if, if Lehman is on? Um, I asked her to get on. I didn't see her name as of yet. Okay. I do see one hand raised so far, Eric from Hostos, uh, and there's Donna Drayton also has a hand raised. Um, any preference on the order? Really quickly, okay, if we'll jump around and come right back. Um, Eric Radiski, Director of Government Affairs for Hostels Community College. You could unmute. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll be reading our uh, capital budget testimony. Um, Dear Borough President Gibson, on behalf of Hostos Community College, I am submitting a request for FY23 capital funds in support of a campus-wide renovation project. Project synopsis. With the opening of the Hostos Advisement Center at 429 Grand Concourse in early 2023, Hostos will have the opportunity to repurpose approximately 10,000 square feet of space across three existing buildings on campus. These are spaces currently in use at Hostos that will be freed up when certain offices are transferred to the 429 Grand Concourse building. By reconfiguring, upgrading, and equipping these spaces, the college has an opportunity to provide students, faculty, and staff with updated spaces for a range of activities such as computer labs, adjunct offices, a prayer and meditation room, and student lounge space. Anticipated completion is March 2025. The FY23 Borough President Resume request is for $6 million. The state match is $6 million. Despite the upheavals that the pandemic has caused, Hostos needs room to expand to meet the needs of our students and the expected growth and enrollment in the coming years as the Bronx recovers from COVID-19. Repurposing and renovating existing spaces on campus represents a significant opportunity to meet those needs in a timely and efficient manner. Signed, Daisy Coco de Filippis, 
PhD, president of Hostos Community College. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eric. I'll I'll turn it to my colleague Betty if you have any questions. No, no, I'm good. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, just real quick, I'll touch on the raising hand function again because we've had a lot more people connect. Um, so if you have connected. As an attendee, you can raise your hand in WebEx software. There's a raise hand button down at the bottom. Um, if you're on a computer, if you're on a tablet or a smartphone, it should be somewhere along the bottom. And I see a couple more hands have been raised. Um, so if there's any preference on the order. There's Arnaldo Arnold Lopez from Pagones, uh, Donna Drayton, Joel Berg, and Rocky Bucano are names that I see with raised hands. I'm gonna follow the order really quickly, and if um, folks are not available, then we'll move on to okay. the next one. Wonderful. Um, Aaron Busca from the New York Botanical Gardens. All righty. Um, Dr. Amina Ali from the Federal of International Gender and Human Rights. Deputy um, Robin is on now from Lehman. Wonderful. Robin, Director of Campus and Facilities Planning from Lehman College. Please proceed. Thanks. Hi, um, this is Robin Auchincloss. Um, I'm Director of... Sorry, Robin. Um, you may just need to unmute again there. There. Can you hear me? Yes. Sorry. Okay, super. Yeah, um, I'm Robin Auchincloss, Director of Campus and Facilities Planning at Lehman College. Dr. Fernando Delgado, President of Lehman College, sends his regards and thanks you for your continuing support of Lehman and for the opportunity to present the college's capital needs. This capital request will provide funding for the initial outfitting for the new Nursing Education Research and Practice Center, which is currently under construction at Lehman College. Lehman's Department of Nursing offers undergraduate and graduate programs to a culturally diverse student body. Nursing is the largest degree program, and our program is the only public nursing program in the Bronx and the largest public program of its kind between SUNY Binghamton and Hunter College in Manhattan. Um, to accommodate expansion of the program and provide new teaching and training technologies that support current and future nursing pedagogy and campus-based simulation labs, and to provide resources for nursing students to engage in research, the college broke ground in December of 2021 on a new $90 million nursing education research and practice center. The concrete foundation is poured and completed, and the steel is going up. Um, once completed, this state-of-the-art facility will provide opportunities for high-quality healthcare education and, in turn, better healthcare opportunities. We thank the borough president for a generous allocation in 2020 of $3 million to support healthcare education in the Bronx, and this request is for an additional $3 million in funding for furnishings, technology, and equipment to outfit the new facility. On behalf of Lehman College, I thank you for your ongoing support for our students and your consideration of this capital request. Um, if Sandy's not on, uh, then I can continue to, and I can describe the discretionary request as well. I don't know if you, if. Yeah, that would be great. Okay, why don't I do that? Um, no, Sandy, uh, I do see Sandy is on, so I just oh, super. requested her oh, to you. unmute. <laughs> uh, great. All right. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, terrific. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I had difficulty uh, being unmuted. Um, Yes, this is the first time Lehman has ever um, applied for discretionary funding. And I'd like to just quickly go over the discretionary funding that we're applying for. Um, we're applying for $149,000 for food security and a sustainability uh, initiative. The purpose of this is to build a holistic view of the food system for Lehman students and to help them address the structural barriers that cause 
food insecurity, as well as providing much, much needed um, nutritional food through our food bank. The second is um, we are requesting $230,000 for the mail initiative on leadership and excellence. For many years, both CUNY and Lehman have been dedicated to recruiting, supporting, and graduating more men of color through programs such as the Urban Mail Initiative. While this programs and others have made achievements toward this goal, Black and Latinx men are still underrepresented both at Lehman and in higher education. Currently, almost 73% of Bronx uh, residents identify as Black or African American. Only one third of our student male population are Black or African American. And this recruitment effort is aimed at hiring full-time personnel to do outreach to schools and the community. Our third request is for $209,000 for the Lehman Counseling Center. This is so needed, as we all know, mental health is so important, especially in this time of COVID. And this initiative will help um, us be able to assist students better by hiring more staff. The goal is to help students cope and manage the challenges of college and their personal lives in a productive and healthy manner. Our next initiative is for disability services. Also very needed, we're requesting $108,000. Um, the Office of Student Disability Services is currently trying to expand. One of the greatest needs of our students served by the SDS office is to assist them in handling their academic obligations. Many students with disabilities struggle with balancing college, treatment needs, and extra time that they need to complete coursework, plus life and family. And finally, we are asking for $965,000 to increase our academic advisement program. Our students, many are first generation or immigrants. They don't have the knowledge or support necessarily of members of their community and family and greatly need academic advisement to help them be successful in college. And thank you very, very much for this time and um, able me, enabling me to unmute. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandy, Robin, uh, Lehman College for, for all that you do and, and for presenting th these requests um, with such detail and advocacy. Thank you so much. We will move to um, Rocky Bucano Universal Hip Hop Museum. All right, Rocky, I uh, just requested that you unmute. Go ahead. Beautiful. Uh, hello, can you hear me? All right, very good. Uh, good morning, Honorable Bronx Borough President Vanessa L. L. Gibson. It did, it worked. <laughs> uh, congratulations, Borough President Gibson, on your new role as the Chief Executive of the Bronx. I look forward to helping you advance a more diverse, sustainable, and more equitable future for the Bronx cultural institutions. I'm Rocky Buchano, President and Executive Director of the Universal Hip Hop Museum, the Bronx and New York City's newest cultural institution. And, I, and I'm here to testify uh, for our capital needs for fiscal year 2023. The Universal Hip Hop Museum is currently under construction at the Bronx Point Development in the Mott Haven section of the Bronx. The Bronx is home of hip hop and mambo. 
It is home to many small and large cultural organizations and venues. But the Bronx is often overlooked when it comes to funding to support the arts and other types of cultural programs. New York City's cultural institution groups receives the bulk of New York City's funding, leaving small cultural institutions with little or no funding to produce high quality programs for the residents of the Bronx. It is time for New York City to invest more into projects like the Universal Hip Hop Museum so that more programs can be created for the borough's BIPOC community. I've witnessed hip hop's rise from a ground shifting youth movement that began in the Bronx parks and streets of the 70s to becoming today's most popular music, art form and culture worldwide. Hip hop is uniquely New York and, and is distinctly America's greatest cultural export. Hip hop has always been and still is the voice of the voiceless. It is the culture of the disenfranchised. Hip hop's influence is seen everywhere from film and television to activism and politics. Hip hop has been used by BIPOC communities around the world to preserve tribal language and is presently used in urban cities across the country to engage students in STEAM based educational programs. Hip hop is the fabric of today's global economy. The Universal Hip Hop Museum's economic impact on the Bronx will be transformative. Construction of the future home of hip hop has already created 300 construction jobs. When the UHHM opens in 2024, there will be 45 full time positions and many temporary positions to fill. I've advocated for a permanent home for hip hop for, for New York City for many years. I fought hard during the past 12 years to make sure that the Universal Hip Hop Museum's future home is located in the Bronx where the culture originated. It could not be located any other place and be true to the history of hip hop. In May 2021, the Universal Hip Hop Museum broke ground on its 53,000 square foot state of the art home at the Bronx Point. I'm proud that the UHHM now serves as the cultural anchor of New York City's largest affordable housing project. In 2024, when the doors of the UHHM finally opens to the public, it will instantly become New York City's newest global attraction, join an estimated 1.2 million annual visitors uptown to the Bronx. Since the journey began, the organization has produced a variety of educational, cultural, and social justice programs serving BIPOC students and family across the five boroughs. The Universal Hip Hop Museum's Revolution of Hip Hop exhibit located at the Bronx Terminal Market has been a great delivery platform for our educational and cultural programs. Since opening in 2019, the Revolution of Hip Hop has greeted tens of thousands of visitors from around the world and has become a favorite educational resource for middle school, high school, and college educators. This year, the UHHM is producing a hip hop physics program for BIPOC middle school and high school students led by Dr. Stefan Alexander, author of the book, Fear of a Black Universe. The Universal Hip Hop Museum is also using its high profile to create a new, a new social impact program called Shoot Cameras, Not Guns, designed to help reduce the increase in gun violence that is committed by both young men and young women who live in under-resourced communities. Our educational and social impact programs will inspire, empower, and uplift the city's most vulnerable young men and young women. The Universal Hip Hop Museum is seeking $8 million in capital support to help fund the museum's interior fit-out and $175,000 in discretionary funding to support educational, cultural, and social impact programs such as Shoe Cameras, Not Guns. I'm thankful for the support that the Bronx Borough President, City Council, and Mayor's Office has provided in years past and look forward to working with Borough President Gibson, the City Council, and Mayor Eric Adams to bring the museum's construction to the finish line. I thank you for the time. Rocky, thank you so much for your detailed testimony. Before we proceed, I just wanna acknowledge our honorable Bronx Borough President, Vanessa L. Gibson, who has joined our budget hearing. Thank you so Borough much, President. Madam Deputy. Thank you, Deputy Bar President. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's good to see everyone today for our Borough Board hearing. Uh, for the mayor's FY23 budget, uh, the preliminary budget that has been proposed by Mayor Eric Adams. I am excited to join all of you. This is my very first budget hearing in my new capacity as your Bronx Borough President. 
uh, but I am certainly not new to budgets proposed by the city of New York. I worked on eight budgets uh, during the last administration as a member of the New York City Council. So it feels good to be on this side. And I wanna thank all of our district managers and our board chairpersons for joining us today, as well as the staff of the elected officials, uh, my colleagues in the New York City Council, and to all of our staff, and to everyone who has already signed up to testify about your budget priorities for this year. I look forward to working with you to continue to support all of your organizations, the visions that you have set forth, our cultural institutions, our hospitals, our healthcare institutions, educational institutions, colleges, all of the stakeholders that have done so work, so much work to build up the Bronx. I am grateful for all of you for your service and for your commitment. Uh, and as we begin this new year, uh, this new budget that is being proposed by Mayor Eric Adams, I look forward to working with you as your Bronx Borough President. So today is really an opportunity to hear from all of our non for profits and community partners about your budget priorities for this fiscal year. And we will make sure that we continue to work together as the budget process moves along. Um, and obviously we uh, await the anticipation of the uh, executive budget that will come out in April and moving on to budget adoption. Uh, so I thank you all for joining us and thank you to the Deputy Bar President, Janet Piguero, and all of our staff in the Bar President's office for all of your work. Uh, Marisol Halpern, Tom Lucania, uh, Betty McCray, and everyone in our team, thank you for your work today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Borough President. Thank you for your words. Thank you for joining us and, and thank you for leaving the charge here. Um, up next, we have uh, North Bronx Youth Sports, Coville. Well, uh, Deputy, okay. what's the name? Uh, the, for that organization? North Bronx Youth Sports. Okay. Um, do we have a, an individual's name or, or just the organization? I have Colville Bascom. Okay. Um, I do not okay. see that name okay. in the attendee list at this time. Great. Chris Norwood, Executive Director for Health People Community Preventative Health Institute. Okay. Chris, I've just added you so you can use video and audio and if you unmute oh. <laughs> okay <laughs> we got webex to work <laughs> here we go okay thank you so much um it's really good to see everyone and especially our new borough president and all the officials who are now trying to help us because as you know, the Bronx really, really has suffered in the past two years. Uh, I'm executive director of Health People, the city's leading uh, entirely peer educator based uh, disease prevention and care organization, and also co founder of Communities Driving Recovery, which is a citywide network really insisting on the role of community groups in the recovery of our city. Uh, New York is facing unprecedented mass illness, both from chronic disease that has been allowed to fester for decades and uncountable cases of long COVID. Nothing like this has ever happened before, ever, where chronic disease and infectious disease have collided in a self-feeding explosion. The impact in New York is almost certainly the worst in the nation, as witnessed a 356% increase in New York City diabetes deaths in the first COVID surge. The price for both New York City and New York State Departments of Health, having largely ignored chronic disease, especially diabetes, for more than a decade has been horrible, and now it is worse. This nightmare is especially explosive in the Bronx, which has the city's highest rate of diabetes and most other chronic disease. The city must be in partnership with stricken communities. The basic fact is that the single most effective and expeditious way to start to reduce the impact of chronic disease is to give stricken communities the support to take the lead in improving their own self-care and directly educating their community members in self-care. 
On the one hand, the health department and H and H deserve credit for building a strong network and actual funding for community partners to fight COVID. Unfortunately, now there is still no evidence in the budget that they are using these vital partnerships that they built through test and trace to fight chronic disease with all the focus that must occur. We now actually seem to be operating under three budgets. There is the last administration budget, uh, a largely undefined budget from the new administration, which is understandable. And then there is the $5.9 billion federal COVID recovery budget uh, that the last administration uh, planned. And those plans are substantially unfair to the Bronx. Uh, just the Bronx must carefully track that money and ask for revisions. Just for one example, in the last round of RFPs from the recovery budget, Mott Haven was declared a low need area. Don't ask me, I know how that happened, but it's obviously not a low need area. And these are the sorts of things that happen that we wanna be in contact with the borough president's office when we see them to report them in right away so we can respond and respond you know, with the facts. Uh, most important, however, in none of these budgets do we see any focused effort to fight chronic disease in a way that can protect people from COVID Oh, uh, Chris, I think that your audio got remuted there accidentally yeah. just, uh, a few seconds ago. Mm. <laughs> I don't know. We, we missed the last two sentences. The last two sentences? Yeah. Okay. Uh, we had in the last round of RFPs, Mod Haven was declared low need. We had that. Okay, I'll go from that. Yeah. Um, but none of these budgets, do we see any focused effort to fight chronic disease in a way that can both protect people from COVID and from the mass ill health, especially rampant in low income communities. Let me focus on diabetes, which is absolutely the worst in the Bronx to underscore what could be done. Diabetes is the gateway disease. It worsens heart disease and hypertension and kidney disease. It accounts for most amputations and 45% of dialysis. Yet the New York City Department of Health refuses and still refuses, even through the level of COVID deaths and complications, to undertake basic effective self-care education proven and proven and proven to lower blood sugar, depression, complications, and costs. Community groups could easily be trained to bring this vital education to high need neighborhoods. When we at Health People obtained special federal funding, which unfortunately was ended in the first COVID surge, we trained peer educators from the community who engaged almost 2,000 people on Medicaid in real diabetes self care education. When we took this education to homeless shelters, the City Department of Health's own evaluation showed that emergency room visits plunged by 45%. It is unquestionable that this effective education for diabetes and other chronic disease had been widely available before COVID. We would have had significantly fewer deaths and complications. And now we cannot have a real recovery with communities moving from mass sickness to new wellness unless the city does finally support community groups to bring life-saving self-care education to those who most need it. And the Bronx really needs to take the forefront in insisting that this happens. Uh, we really do ask you uh, to support our discretionary request to the uh, city council uh, because the city won't do it. I don't know why, but we are hoping with the new city council and awareness that they will do it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris, for, for your testimony. Really appreciate all the work that uh, your organization has done through through COVID and beyond. Thank you. Um, up next, I'm gonna call Oscar Martinez, uh, JFK campus. All right, Oscar, you should have the ability to unmute and if you'd like, turn on video. Can you guys hear me and see me? Good morning, everyone. How you guys doing? I'm glad that the video is on because I ironed the shirt and I was going to be upset. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> we got it to work. We got it to work. Thank you. But we all yes. we all got specially dressed, right? Right. Yeah, I mean, I almost I was I was gonna have a breakdown. I'm like, no video, but um <laughs> Good morning, everyone. It's almost Friday. Uh, what I wanted to come here and speak about, first and foremost, congratulations to President Gibson. Glad to have a sister up there. Glad to just basically see women in power. Shout out Binghamton. And Binghamton. I am here to discuss. Yes. Uh, I'm here to discuss uh, a proposal to get a new field for John F. Kennedy campus in uh, the North Bronx. The reason that I am representing and making this proposal is because I grew up in the area. I grew up, uh, I'm, I'm very Bronx, for lack of a better term. I went to public school. I uh, graduated from BCC. I graduated from Lehman. And now I want to kind of inject some of that energy back into my community. And I coached football at John F. Kennedy. And I actually played against them a number of times while I was in high school. The first time I ever went to a game, it was mesmerizing to me because it was something out of a movie. It was Friday Night Lights. Uh, if you guys don't know, Kennedy is one of the few schools in the Bronx that play on Friday nights. There's only three of them. And it was just uh, an infectious atmosphere, something out of a movie, but Bronx to it. Hot 97 was there. They were playing uptown. So it gave me some Bronx pride. The reason I didn't go to Kennedy is because I didn't like the red uniforms. And my friends told me that Clinton had more of the pretty girls. So that's what the decision I made, and that's why I went over there. And the thing that I notice now coaching there is that the field is not something to be proud of. Teams from Brooklyn, from Staten Island come to play us, and they literally just laugh at the field and say, how do you guys play on this? The field is torn up. A number of kids have gotten hurt, not only just on the team, but also in the school because they host gym classes there. And all the other boroughs, if you look at their athletic programs and facilities, they're top of the line. Staten Island and Brooklyn in particular, the, the teams from there, all of the fields are pristine, all of the fields are nice. And I, I ask all of you to think of why isn't the Bronx top of the line? We literally set the trends in the city for everything. We are at the top of the line when it comes to all of the culture and all of the, for lack of a better term, swag in the city. So why if why are the athletics lacking? Uh, the the proposal is to, for a new running track, a new football field slash soccer field slash cross field, and then LED lights. The LED lights will result in thirty to fifty percent in uh, energy savings, so it's clean energy. Uh, the field and track would also solve a problem of kids not having anything to do. If you guys know or have kids around you, you understand that it's just tablets and technology and kids aren't really out and about. This proposal, this project would be the start of what I envision. My vision is to have a kind of a complete makeover of the Bronx and the athletic facilities, starting with this field, then Van Cortland, then a couple of other fields for some schools, but just giving kids something to be proud of, something to, to do. I, while I was in high school and even beyond, I've seen kids not choose to be in gangs and choose sports over that, uh, choose sports and have them get scholarships to school. This past season, we have six kids on our team get scholarships to universities because of sports, sports scholarships. So not only is it academically appeasing, appeasing but it's also health related where kids have something to do and some way to run around and let loose that energy. And it also gives them something to do after school let alone the biggest thing, no more kids are going to get hurt. So that, that's kind of the basis of my proposal. It's, a, a, it's for capital funds. Uh, it's a $3 million project for the fiscal year of 2023. And the anticipation is it will go, is going to be done in March of 2023. I've spoken to a few uh, general contractors and the SCA, but just, just think about, the, this is the, the last thing that I'll say is as Bronxites, you don't want other boroughs looking down on us because we don't deserve that. We start everything. We've been through a ton of pain, but in the Bronx, a lot of people don't really care or don't take initiative on projects like this. My, my reason for being here and speaking to everyone is for the kids, for the youth. And we've had uh, proposals about college and universities, but in order for them to get there, the high school experience needs to be paramount. And it not only needs to be, uh, most of the time, public high school right now is an obligation. And I want it to be a choice. I want the kids to say, hey, I want to go to that school. I want to go to this school and not just it's my zone school and I'm going to go there. So this proposal is the start of many. 
this is going to be a makeover of the Bronx, and this is going to be the start of something very, very well. Thank you, and happy Friday tomorrow. Oscar, thank you so much for your testimony and for your advocacy, especially around uh, the youth uh, of the Bronx. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to move to Bernadette Ferrara, president of Van Ness Neighborhood Alliance. All right, Bernadette, you should have the option to unmute. And if you'd like, use video. Uh, hi, hi, how are you? Um, I don't know if my video is on. So, uh, not, not yet. No. Okay. Um, good. Uh, good morning, everybody. Yes, it's still morning. <laughs> um, my name is Bernadette Ferrara. I'm the president of the Van Ness Neighborhood Alliance. The Van Ness community is an East Bronx neighborhood with many families and a diverse population. It's part of the 49th precinct, the 49th clergy council and community board 11. Community Board 11 has 51 board members with four representing Van Ness for the last 13 years. I'm one of those board members, and I'm also the president of Van Ness Neighborhood Alliance, which was formed in 2010. Uh, VNNA has reached many accomplishments for Van Ness in a few short years, but our major community goals are including a community center, middle schools, youth programs, senior programs, and more senior housing. They are still outstanding. While we are working very hard to raise the bar on quality of life concerns, these major goals have been desperately needed for decades. Community center. I grew up, went to school, still live, and now represent Van S. We have never had a community center like the Kipps Bay Boys and Girls Club in Van Ness, Morris Park, or Pelham Parkway. As chair of the Education, Culture, and Youth Service Committee of Community Board 11, my focus is our children. They are our future. The children of Van Est, Pelham Parkway, and Morris Park need a community center. They need a place for summer camps. As a single mother in Van Nest, I can never afford Bronx House, and my son, as other children, missed out on so much. Middle schools. Community Board 11, which is in CEC 11, is owed 3,000 middle school seats. Presently, parents with children at a K-5 school have to take their children out in fourth grade to find a place for their children to continue their education in a school far from the community. We need our 3,000 middle school seats. Senior housing. Van Nest has one small senior apartment building, Monsignor Fiorentino Senior Apartments, that have closed down their waiting list application for the past nine years. Father Puccini built this for the seniors of Van Nest who want to stay in Van Nest. This mission statement has not been honored. In the past nine years, so many seniors have asked me for help to stay in their community of Van Nest. Van Ness needs more senior housing and more senior programs. Over the past three years, the mayor's office has found billions of dollars to force our communities of Van Ness, Pelham Parkway, and Morris Park with building and funding of men's homeless shelters and no money for our children's future. A desperate need that spans over five decades, way before the need of homeless shelters. Thank you all for allowing me this opportunity to advocate for my Van Ness community and our children. Bernadette, thank you so much. And, and I'm seeing in the chat that um, Councilwoman uh, Althea Stevens uh, representative is asking for your contact. So feel free to drop it in the chat. Okay, thank you so much. Wonderful. Um, I'm just gonna go back really quickly to the top of the list and, and see if other folks have joined us. Um, Aaron Busca from the New York Botanical Gardens. Uh, yes, I see Aaron. Aaron, you should have the option to unmute and use video if you'd like. Great. Good afternoon. Thank you, Deputy.
Hi everyone, my name is Aaron Boshka. I bring this lecture to highlight uh, my thanks to the president. Uh, as we all look forward to spring and springs, uh, we are grateful for your, all of your leadership to our borough, our neighbors, and our neighborhood we serve. NYBG is a city owned cultural institution. And the buildings and grounds are both the responsibility and the asset of local government. Um, as a city institution, the garden's capital needs are immense, like many institutions. For FY21, as part of our master plan, we are seeking funding for something called the Workers' Operations Center. This is for our DC 37 uh, union staff, which is an excellent wor workforce of men and women, mostly Bronxites. The engineers. I'm so sorry, Aaron. I don't. I don't mean to cut you off, but if you can just speak a little louder for folks. I'm so sorry. Thank you. How's that? I think yeah, that's better. Thank that you better? so much. Yes. Thank, Thank you, you very much. I'm such so bad at technology. Uh, so for the administrative staff, the engineers, carpenters uh, that make NYBG safe and accessible for our one million guests. Um, nearly all of our services depend on these men and women, and they don't have a safe, adequate uh, sort of work area and trade area. So the existing site has about three build buildings that are currently assigned. While they're safe and functional, they don't meet the current workforce needs. So a new net zero, highly efficient building uh, would meet these sort of design needs with a large general work area, small areas for specific, specific, specific trades, a multi-purpose room, a lunchroom with a kitchenette, workforce training room, showers, locker rooms, etc. Um, w. Burr President, the exciting part is that we've raised quite a lot of this money. It's a in total a $23 million project. We've raised 15 or 16 of that, and we are asking the borough president today for $500,000 in FY23 capital support so that we can move this project to completion. And that concludes my testimony. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Aaron. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Um, up next, Dr. Amina Ali, the Federation of International Gender and Human Rights. Not sure if Dr. Amina was able to join. So I'm just looking at the uh, list of attendees. I don't see the name, okay. but if if they we'll are here, back. please. Just use the raise hand function so I see you. Dr. Thomas from Bronx Community College. Let's see. Dr. Arnaldo J. Lopez from Pregones, Excuse Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. This is Betty. Dr. Sakanabi, he's on. Thomas is Sakanabi. Oh, there we go. Okay, Thomas, uh, hold on. One second, you should be able to unmute. Thank you, Betty. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Looks like your mic's unmuted. Go ahead. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Madam Deputy Bureau President, I want to say good morning to everybody and uh, thank you for allowing us to participate in this uh, hearing this morning. I don't think I've met you personally, but I'm looking forward to making an appointment to come down to your office and actually talk to you and share our goals and visions from Bronx Community College with you, Madam Deputy Bureau President. So thank you for hosting this this morning. Thank you. Again, good. I think we're still in morning. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. My name is Thomas Sekinigwe. I'm the president of Bronx uh, Community College. I would like to thank every, the borough president and the deputy borough president for allowing us to be part of this public hearing. Uh, before I even go into our ask, I want to say thank you for all of your past support for our students and for Bronx Community College. We realize that we cannot do the things that we do. We cannot fulfill our missions and objectives without the support of all of our elected officials. So for that, I want to say on behalf of our students, thank you very much for what you've done for us in the past. What I know you're going to do for us today, and I know what you're going to do for us in the future. So thank you very much. One of the things we want to ask for today is for critical support, capital funding to support the building on our campus, which is the Gould Memorial Library. We know as community colleges, we have to start from the local level. 
So we know every dollar you give to us is matched by the state at 100% level. So what we're asking for today is funding for the Good Memorial Library elevator installation. The installation of a new elevator in Good Memorial Library will provide the building, allow the building to provide full service to members of our community. This is really needed because the building as of now is not ADA compliant. As you know, the Good Memorial Library is one of the finest bureau architecture in the United States. However, because of the modern building code violations, this historical building is currently being un underutilized. For the, for the financial year 2023, we're requesting for $1 million as a part of the install an elevator into the building. Uh, in, in the summer of 2029, a contract for $4 million was awarded to restore the roof dome, the windows, and to create a new egress to the building. Of that $14 million, members of the Bronx delegation contributed $6.9 million. And I'm pleased to inform you that construction started in uh, excuse me. construction started in 2000, fall of 2019, and we're months away from the completion of this capital project that will increase the return capacity from 79 to 300. This will allow more people into the building, except one violation code that we still be having. That's accessibility. The currently people with that are physically challenged are unable to come into the building. And we need this money to be able to solve this problem. The $1 million we're asking for is a part of the $6.9 million we'll be getting. And the state total money from the from the Bronx, uh, from the city will be 3.5, and that will be matched by the city. Questions? Thank you, Doctor. No questions from my end, but I do see Ken Brown. Ken. Oh, thank you very much. No, uh, <laughs> good to see you, Doctor. Um, I just wanted to say that our offices formerly were in the Gould Library, and it is a magnificent building. And the opportunity to have that opened up with an elevator to make it ADA compliant would be a great boon to the community. So I, I just wanted to add that the conversation, if that's all right. Ken, thank you so much for adding that. You're absolutely right. One of the limiting things in the building right now is the lack of ADA uh, compliance in the building. In fact, when we host events in that building, we have complaints in the past, people not people not being able to come in. So this elevator will go a long way in solving that problem, the installation of the elevator. Dr. Bola. Two other hands raised, yeah. Dr. Bola and Sam mm -hmm. from Council Member Sanchez's office. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Madam Deputy and uh, President uh, Chamos. Thank you so much. Uh, just to echo the sentiment of uh, Ken Brown, the district manager. Uh, yes, uh, you are technically a landlord, uh, CB5, and thank you for housing us for the longest. And uh, we look forward to supporting this project so that uh, we'll be able to continue to serve the community as, long, as much as possible. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Bala. And Sam, was there a mm -hmm. question? Uh, if so, you can unmute. I just wanted to again echo the statement that uh, the CPP resigned in March of 14, but they do serve all of the Bronx and they've been a great, uh, great, great partner. Especially, you know, with the recent fires, they opened their doors to you know, lend their support. And so just wanted uh, to echo what Ken Brown said and Dr. Bola and, and just express our support for the project. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. And Dr. Uh, Council Member Stevens is also asking for your number in the chat if you wanna share your contact information. That'd be great. Thank you again for your testimony. Um, I'll call on uh, Progonis Puerto Rican Traveling Theater. Arnaldo Lopez. Uh, right now, Dr. Arnaldo. Lopez is on. Okay, great. Yeah, I should have the option to unmute. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much uh, to uh, President Gibson, uh, Deputy President Peguero, and 
um, capital budget manager uh, McRae for making this possible. I really uh, I'm, I'm grateful to be here. I, I feel that this is a, a welcoming environment for testimony and um, and I am really encouraged by hearing uh, my colleagues. So uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, as a local company and anchor cultural facility serving 40,000 diverse participants, including youth, adults, and seniors, the artists and staff of Pregones Theater see every reason for sustained and additional city budget allocations in both expense and capital. Talk to us and to our peers in arts and culture, there are verifiable needs for more equitable funding and development of our cultural and educational programming, operations, construction, renovation, beautification, signage, ease of access, public transportation, and related standards of resident and visitor safety and comfort. Our company's home neighborhood of Mott Haven near the 149th Street Bridge and Manhattan is especially ready for upgrades that help cement the role of existing enterprises, enhancing quality of life and generating new economic activity. Cultural groups and arts organizations add vibrancy to our Bronx neighborhoods through the excellence of their artistic and educational programs. I'm thinking specifically of organizations who champion people of color, immigrants, LGBTQ communities, women, working families, the global majority, who actively connect the arts to priorities of social, racial, and climate justice, who work across sectors and industries to help generate inclusive and holistic wellness, resiliency, and economic prosperity. This network is the real purveyor of cultural sustenance for New York City, and yet it receives only 15% of funds distributed citywide through the Department of Cultural Affairs. Pregones Theater joins other peer organizations in calling for increased support and the establishment of a cultural equity fund as part of the executive budget. 1% of the city's total budget spent on culture would make a major impact on equitable access and engagement, especially for deserving but historically underserved communities. Our theater company is moving forward with city funded construction and equipment projects totaling over $10 million and that are certain to yield many times the price of investment over time through enhanced employment capacity, cross-sector economic activity, and public programs. Because the needs of arts and cultural organizations like ours are multiple and overlapping, and because we don't typically have interest-bearing capital endowments, the city is our number one partner to get things done. By way of example, my theater has consistently raised the safety, comfort, and quality of life for patrons since its first city capital budget allocation decades ago. For fiscal year 23, we seek funding to cover budget shortfall of $500,000 for construction of a new education and company headquarters building on Walton Avenue and $130,000 to put in a state-of-the-art theatrical sound system. Our theater is also seeking $200,000 through the vital Coalition of Theaters of Color Initiative for sustained arts learning opportunities for youth and one-time artist projects. CTC is an immensely important lifeline of funding for organizations of color in the performing arts, and we would hope that someday it would be baselined. These modest investments have outsized results, helping us secure a place for our theater and the Bronx among the city's preferred cultural destinations. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Lopez. Really appreciate your testimony this morning. Um, we are going to move to uh, North Bronx Youth Sports. Covo Bascom. So I don't no? see the okay. name, but if anybody from that organization is connected, if you could just raise your hand uh, or drop me a note in the chat. No. No, nothing, nothing okay. yet. And a final call for the Federation of International Gender and Human Rights. 
Dr. Amina Ali. Don't see the organization or that individual in the list of attendees either at the moment. Great. Um, so we will open it up for folks uh, that didn't get a chance to, to sign up. Um, up first, I have Roxanne Delgado from Friends of Pelham Parkway. All right, Roxanne, you should have the option to unmute in just a second here and use video if you'd like. Hello? Hi, yep. this is Roxanne Delgado with Friends of Pelham Parkway. Thank you for allowing me to speak and thank you, thank you to our new borough president, Vanessa Gibson. Congratulations to her, uh, to her representing us in the Bronx. We're very proud of her. Our group was founded by a woman of color. We've been cleaning the parkway for the last five years. Just last year, we held over 35 events. Our average turnout is between 20 to 25 volunteers. And when we make phone calls and emails, we get about 45 to 60 volunteers. So we do a lot with very little. And our main focus is uh, environmental justice, social justice, and teaching the children how to care for the community and nature. And one of the main problems that we have is when we do our park cleanups and we have about 20 to 25 volunteers and including all ages, some kids as young as five years old help clean the parkway. Uh, we clean the parkway, but the park doesn't empty out the overfilled trash bags, trash cans for, for days. And there's a lack of respect because our community taking, taking stewardship of our green spaces of our own backyard and taking out time and resource to clean the park, the parkway. And when the our parks department doesn't respect us enough to come and clean, empty out the overfilled trash can, it really um, demoralizes our community and our volunteers. So we really need our mayor to please fund the parks department at least 1% of the budget, but also for our Bronxboro Parks Department to be play fair, to, to uh, distribute the maintenance fairly with, uh, across, the par across the Bronx. It can't just be uh, where the uh, neighborhoods are more wealthier or they have more political pow uh, power. It has to be done fairly, regardless of the demographics, regardless, regardless of the income. Also, we take care of street trees. Now, the mayor mentioned he's going to plant at least an additional 1 million trees, but they need to care for the trees. So right now, I have cleaned so many dirty tree pits and some of the trees are neglected. They have hanging limbs, broken uh, branches, uh, things tied, uh, wrap around trees that we can't remove because they're too high. So we really need, if they're going to plant more trees, we need tree care uh, 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 funding allocated with the new trees being planted. And for the new the trees that we have now, so I'm asking, please, we need to get more funding for parks, but also for the maintenance we distribute fairly throughout the Bronx. Also, we need uh, money for the trees to care for the street trees and also for the dog run, because parks does not care for the dog run. And it was mentioned, God damn it, the parks relies on the community to care for the dog run. And we've been very active in the dog run too, in the Bronx Park dog run. But unfortunately, there's no water source to clean the dog run. And we, my friend and neighbor just had to take his dog to the vet, pay $600 for antibiotics because the dog must have ate something or licked something on the dog run and he, he, and he caught an infection. So we need desperately a water source for this dog run because it's shared by three different districts, shared by community 12, community board, uh, I mean, um, city council district 13, 15, and 12. From all those three different districts, they shared the same dog run in Bronx Park East. Now, I like to say that I'm thankful for this uh, hearing, but unfortunately, Community Board 11 did not hold their own budget hearing. And so, this service to the community because in order for people to be involved, it starts from the ground level, and that's the Community Board. And the Community Board again did not hold a budget hearing as they didn't hold last year. In order for people to understand how government works, we need Community Board 11 to be more uh, involved in the community and allow different voices. Because when I'm involved in my Friends of Palm Parkway, you'd be surprised how many people are so actively involved in our group. And they, and they actually thank me for having this group because they want to be involved in the community. This is the only outlet they have that right now to participate and give back to the community. We have such a good community willing to do the work, willing to contribute to the community, but we don't seem to have that much um, um, uh, entities or, or a community board that's willing to um, embrace these people. So thank you for the board president and, and I'm sorry I didn't prepare a, a statement. I just signed in, but thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Roxanne. And, and really quickly, what is the, the dollar amount, the budget ask? Just well, for the, 
dog run the uh, in, increased to for the water source inside the dog park dog run increased to um, one hundred twenty five thousand dollars. So since it's over one hundred thousand, it's a capital fund project. For the parks funding, we need at least one percent of the total city budget um, uh, for parks funding. And for the street trees, I don't know because it depends on how many trees they uh, they plant this year. But we need any trees planted. We need uh, funding to care for those trees because they plant the trees here. But you should see how they're neglected. It's very sad. Why plant something just for the tree to die or be neglected? It's very sad. For me. We try our best by cleaning the tree pits, but we don't have the equipment to uh, prune the tree limb, the broken limbs, or to remove things tied around the limbs. Well, is that, is that Thank you so much. Thank you, Roxanne. Thank, Thank you for your time. For your Thank you. Up next, uh, Sharon Kynan of, uh, I hope I'm not mispronouncing your last name, of Children of Promise. All right, Sharon, you should have the option to uh, unmute. Yes, I am. Can you, hold on. Okay, can you hear me okay? I can hear you, but we can't see you. you there we go. You, you can, can see, see me you now. How come I can't see myself? Hold on. <laughs> if you're connected on the on a phone, which right. it looks like maybe you are, you may not be able to see yourself, but we can see you. Okay, but you can see me. No yes, worries. Okay. Thank you. Hopefully everything's in place. Okay, there I am. Okay, I want to make sure I'm centered. Good morning. Good morning to everyone. Good morning, Borough President. So great for this opportunity to be able to speak with you this morning. Councilmember Stevenson, thank you so much for this time and for everyone on the budget committee. I wanted to first express my appreciation, not only for my colleagues on the call, but again, for having a voice for the organization. As an organization that provides a voice for children of incarcerated parents and families in the Bronx, I appreciate this opportunity for my voice to be heard this morning and to be able to express the ask that I am requesting for the families. So Children of Promise NYC is new to the Bronx. We opened our doors during the pandemic when doors were closing, we were opening, and I'm so happy that the borough president had an opportunity to visit us. So thank you so much again for the time that you visited the organization under the two occasions uh, for Christmas and when we were distributing toys and gifts to our families. Children of Promise NYC, we have a flagship organization program in Bethesda, stuyvesant Brooklyn, and we, are, we opened our doors, as I said, in the Bronx last year. Again, serving specifically children of incarcerated parents. We're the first and only organization in New York City that provides services in an after-school setting. We are a youth development organization, again, specifically for a target population of children of incarcerated parents, but we co-locate with a mental health clinic. We are able to provide mental health services so that we can deal with the stigma, the shame, and for so many of our young people, the secret of having a parent in prison. We provide comprehensive services, so it's not only to the scholars that we serve, but it's also those, to those grandmothers that are now raising their grandchildren, single moms, aunts and uncles, foster parents that are now raising children as a result of the parental incarceration of their loved ones. Children of Promise is a year-round program from September to June. We're an after-school, 3 to 6.30. And in July and August, a summer day camp, we provide services from 8 to 5 p.m., serving, again, 300 children, young, 300 scholars in Brooklyn, and we aspire to service 300 in the Bronx as well. Right now, our registration is up to 142 in our location on 1842 Webster Avenue. And our ask today, we have invested at our location, 25,000 square feet. We have invested over $600,000 in that building between government grants and private donations. And we have made such an investment in the building that we are requesting to purchase the building, not only for the 300 scholars that we will be serving and their families, but for the Bronx community. This is a building that can be used not only by the organization and the families we serve, but other organizations in the community as well as in the Bronx. Right now, we're, as we said, 3 to 6.30 is our after-school program, so we have 25,000 square feet that we can utilize and collaborate and partner and serve other families in the community within, within our spaces when it's not being used by the organization scholars that are participants in the program. So we are asking for $2 million of the $5 million that the 
building purchase costs. We are re receiving funds from other resources, but we are asking the borough president for $2 million so that we can purchase this building. Again, not only to service the 300 young people and scholars and families that we are serving that are children that are impacted by mass incarceration impacting this community, because as you know, mass incarceration is also, we're dealing with poverty, we're dealing with low performing schools, as learning loss as a result of the pandemic. But most importantly, we are a licensed mental health clinic. We are an article 31, which is an adolescent outpatient mental health clinic. So while we provide mental health services to all of the scholars that attend our program, we are able to provide mental health services to other adolescent in, adolescents in the community. We are, our license is open so that we can service other adolescents that need mental health services, especially as a result of the pandemic. We understand the trauma, not only of mass incarceration, but the trauma that the pandemic has caused on so many of our young people and being able to provide mental health services so they can have an outlet to learn and be able to speak and be able to have a voice and be able to speak to licensed clinicians about some of the, the depression, the anxiety, the, the anger for some, so many of our young people are feeling and being able to express that with a licensed clinician and be able to deal with those issues and challenges. So we open up our building to the Bronx community and our ask this morning is for $2 million. Well, our capital ask that we're requesting is for $2 million so that we can purchase this building so that it can remain in the community. Once the building is purchased, it will be an owned by a nonprofit organization. We'll be able to remain in the community and utilize that space to meet the needs as it changes and evolves over time versus the, the building being owned and then being changed into whatever commercial needs might, might arise at a particular time. So that is our ask this morning. Again, I open up if there's any questions, but I, I really appreciate this opportunity this morning to express the needs of the families that we serve. Thank you so much, uh, Sharon and Children of Promise for uh, expanding and pouring into the Bronx. Thank you for delivering such critical services. My pleasure. Especially during these times. I'll turn it to my colleagues to see if there are any questions. Betty, I don't if, if you have any questions. And Sharon, uh, uh, Council Member Sanchez's staff is asking for your contact information in Absolutely. the chat, if you can Absolutely. share. I put it in the chat. Thank you again for your time. Everyone have a great day. Thank you. Um, and if there are any other organizations uh, that wish to offer public testimony, please raise your hand. Uh, we are wrapping shortly, but want to give the floor to folks if, if there are any final remarks. So I do see three other hands raised. Uh, Eleanor Arie, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, you should have the option to unmute in a second. And then following Eleanor, there's Margaret Della, Audrey Duncan, and Maurice Hurd. So Hi. I'm sorry. This is, this is Eleanor. Okay. We can hear you. Okay. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak on behalf of Bronx Community Health Network. And um, thank you and congratulations to um, Borough President Vanessa Gibson. And thank you to the hearing committee for, for this opportunity. Oh. I'm just finding my place here. Okay, we thank you for the opportunity to submit an application for fiscal year 2023 discretionary capital funds for construction of a federally qualified health center that will include integrated telecommunications and electronic health record systems and movable equipment. Since 2015, BCHN embarked on an in-depth strategic planning process, community needs assessments, community forums in co collaboration with Community Board 12, St. Luke's Episcopal Church and other um, community-based organizations, market and financial analyses, and key stakeholder interviews with a cross-section of public and private community leaders. Our findings confirmed those of New York State Medicare re redesign team several years ago of a shortage of primary care in the Northeast Bronx in City Council District 12, Community District 12. We are applying 
for $3.8 million to support this 9.1 million um, state-of-the-art community health center that will provide a broad continuum of high quality, affordable health care and related health services to improve the quality of life and longevity of 7,400 more Bronx residents. Since 1997, BCHN has been collaborating with two major Bronx health care and human services delivery systems to ensure access to federally qualified health center services for as many as 115,000 Bronx residents at 21 community and school-based health centers throughout Bronx County. We've also worked with more than 100 public and private agencies, community and faith-based organizations to further our mission of joint, our joint mission of promoting disease prevention, early treatment, and healthy lifestyles for Bronx residents. Through our social determinants of health referral and navigation services, we strengthen and empower thousands of Bronx sites to successfully manage chronic illnesses, asthma, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, HIV, AIDS, and other services. Um, in November, we submitted a certificate of need application to New York State Department of Health to own and operate an 11,000 square foot building at White Plains Road and 218th Street. The center would be a fa would be phase one of our expansion initiative, which will provide comprehensive family, medical, dental, behavioral, and mental health services for Williamsbridge, Olinville, Wakefield, and Baychester neighborhoods, as well as some per 30 permanent healthcare jobs. This phase also includes a mobile medical and dental health unit satellite of the planned health center that will provide regularly scheduled visits in other community and faith in other communities across the Bronx. The total cost of the projects I mentioned before is 9.1 million and consists of acquisition of the building which we are currently leasing. We started a lease in October um, last year. And we have raised uh, about a third of those dollars and have commitment for a loan. So we really would appreciate um, the opportunity. We appreciate the opportunity to share um, our request and um, to have you um, know and be familiar with with our our work. Um, I know the borough president is very familiar with BCHN, as are some of the other city council members. Um, of the 3.9 million ask, um, 1.5 million of that is from the city council. So we appreciate the opportunity. We, we know that the Northeast Bronx has been an epicenter for um, COVID, for the pandemic. On top of all of the other um, health issues, chronic health issues that it faces. Um, so we really um, are asking for your support and we look forward to being able to serve the Bronx, uh, the Northeast Bronx community, community and the rest of the Bronx uh, beginning in 2023, towards the end of 2023. Thank you very much for the opportunity to share this with you. Thank you so much, Eleanor, and for your work. Really appreciate Thank your you. testimony. Thank you. Chris, are you right. seeing any hands? Yeah, definitely. We have several more hands raised. Okay. Um, so let's go in order. Margaret, um, you should see an option to unmute. Hi, good morning. <clears throat> This is Margaret Della. I'm the CEO at Kingsbridge Heights Community Center. Um, we, um, for the last few years, we've been working with um, the former uh, borough president, Diaz, and um, former council members um, in districts uh, 11 and 14. We have been based at our home in the Kingsbridge Heights section of the Bronx for the last nearly 50 years. And we are our main building where we provide uh, early childhood services, including early Head Start 
Head Start, Early Learn. Uh, we pro provide respite um, services through OPWDD for young people with special needs. We also provide typically uh, developing young people with after school services. Um, so everything from kindergarten up through high school. Um, and it's also our home base for our services that provide um, trauma centered therapy. So we have a free long term uh, therapy program for survivors of child sexual abuse, domestic violence and uh, campus assault. Um, and we nearly were at the finish line and unfortunately, uh, the, the finish line for um, launching our capital project on this landmark 100 year old building. Um, and COVID hit obviously, and that has impacted supply chain and labor costs for us. And despite our best efforts, we've probably received about 15 different bids. Um, and the challenge is that it's a landmark building. We have this beautiful facade, if you've ever seen our space. Um, and we love our building. Obviously, it's been our home for the existence of KHCC. Um, and so what we are coming back to the borough president and um, our uh, new council members with is an ask for an additional 1.5 million. This will help us close the gap on um, outside costs that we have not been able to cover due to these extraneous um, increases in labor and uh, supply chain um, expenses. Uh, we KHCC will have raised, uh, we will have raised nearly a million dollars towards this $3.4 million project, which is a significant lift for us as a nonprofit direct service organization. Um, so we're, we're asking for um, the borough president and our council members support on this ask for us so that we can close the gap um, and really meet all of the, the health and safety needs that our building has and um, get this project off the ground. Last thing I'll say is that we have moved forward with EDC. The project is approved by Landmarks. It's approved by um, the New York Parks Department, uh, which owns our building. And um, so all of those things have moved forward. We have a draft agreement with EDC. We have a bridge loan. We have all these things. So we're nearly there, but we need help in closing the gap. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Margaret and uh, the Kingsbridge Heights Community Center. Really appreciate your testimony. All right, Deputy, next hand I see raise is Audrey Duncan. Uh, Audrey, you should have the ability to unmute. If Audrey is not available Hello. right now. Oh, no, there we go. There we go. Okay, great. I can't see myself, but I'll speak. Um, I'm Audrey Duncan, Director of Community Affairs at BronxNet. Um, thank you to Borough President Gibson and to the entire team for allowing us to share information on our projects. BronxNet is the uh, community media center serving the borough of the Bronx. And we serve the people with uh, production training for all Bronx residents, valuable internships for high school and college students that prepare them for great careers in the media industry. Over the years, we've had hundreds of interns go on to really great positions in the industry in front of the camera as news anchors, reporters, as editors, as every imaginable, imaginable position at places like CNN, NBC, ABC, all of the major networks. And we provide opportunities for Bronx residents to broadcast the shows they produce with our equipment, we are seeking $500,000 from the borough president to expand our services at three locations. Our main operation location is located at Lehman College. Um, we have a location at Mercy College. Right now, we're not seeking uh, equipment for that. We are seeking equipment also for an upcoming location at La Central, where BronxNet will have a brand new facility when that development opens this summer. And we're also seeking um, funds for equipment that would go into the Bronx County Courthouse. So at Lehman College, what we want is a media asset management system. 
which would allow us to properly archive all of the content BronxNet has created over the years, BronxNet and Bronx residents have created over the years, which primarily includes information that people can really use to improve their lives. Information on housing, economic development, health, so on. And we wanna have that archived so that it will be at the fingertips of Bronx residents and even people outside the Bronx. to just click on something and get information and find resources that they can use. Um, that system would be tied with, you know, everything we're doing now. And then at La Centrale, we are in our brand new studios and spaces. We want um, an immersive production stage that would allow Bronx residents, artists, and particularly youth to really ramp up their production capabilities so that they remain even more competitive in the media and film industries. We would hold classes for students, high school students, college students, as well as elementary and middle school students, and you know, to really inspire them to create, use their vision to create um, their best work, to share that work on our channels and on the web, and to use those skills to really go forward in, a, in many emerging industries. Uh, for the Bronx Borough Hall or the Bronx County Courthouse building, we want to have a remote studio. They're a small portable studio. Um, over the years, we've been recording in you know, cooperation with former borough presidents and with current president Gibson, you know, some of the important town hall meetings that go on there, the cultural events that go on there. We want to locate equipment there so that we are better able to record these important meetings in town halls and hearings to share with the Bronx public um, so that people all over the Bronx can really stay connected with what's going on at that level and really, again, uh, get become more civically engaged and just have these resources at their, and information at their fingertips. So we thank you again for giving us this opportunity. Thank you so much, Audrey. Really appreciate your testimony. Thank you. All right, I see a few more hands. Maurice, uh, let me just give you the ability here to unmute. You can go ahead. Uh, Maurice Heard. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I just wanted to take the time out to first thank you all for hosting this wonderful meeting today. Uh, congrats to President Gibson and our deputy president for being part of a history making administration. Salute to you both. My name is Maurice Heard, and I'm the founder of an organization called Most Healthy Bronx. During my 28 years of living in this Bronx, my entire life, I've always been aware of the numerous health disparities and inequities that our residents face. Uh, but I started this organization during the pandemic due to the negative stories and narratives that I was hearing throughout the media. For example, during COVID, we would often hear statistics such as Bronx residents are twice as likely to be hospitalized or die from coronavirus. Um, but as a lifelong public health advocate, I know that there's way more to the story than just these messages that are being portrayed. For a long time, the Bronx has been overlooked and undervalued, um, as the gentleman Oscar uh, Martinez alluded to earlier. Um, so my public request today is for $250,000. Uh, $250, um, with our organization, we hope to start a mobile teaching kitchen. So the purpose of this teaching kitchen is to empower parents, schools, um, so that children can sort of see on um, hands-on cooking demonstrations, um, learn basic cooking skills that they can use to make healthy dishes at home. Um, this is a model that started out in uh, Philadelphia and it's a, it's a pretty successful model. Um, you know, the whole purpose of this initiative is to encourage the consuming of fresh fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and to consume fewer processed and high sugar junk foods at home. Um, it's empowering to the community because it instills confidence in people to cook at home and ignore these easy, quick fixes. 
And it's a, uh, it's a way to build partnerships within the community to connect people to resources so that they can, you know, have this access to real fresh food. Um, and just to give you a bit more insight onto my organization, um, we, we pretty much modeled ourselves after the community health rankings and report that gets issued every year for the past 11 years or so. And as you all are aware, the Bronx has come in dead last for each of these reports. So, um, you know, there's plenty of people doing great work in the community to help stem this tide. So with our organization, we just hope to be part of that. So I just wanted to quickly turn on my video really quick. I don't know if you guys can see me. I don't see myself, but the not 62, that's what we're all about with most healthy Bronx to, you know, make sure that, you know, in future reports, we're no longer 62. Hopefully one day we can reach number one. So again, thank you for uh, the time and uh, have a great day. Thank you so much, Maurice, uh, for your testimony and congratulations on the launch of uh, such an important organization. Thank you. All right, Monique, uh, you have your hand raised. You should have the ability to unmute now. Yeah, hi. Um, I didn't expect to speak, but I just wanted to add, I'm a, a community board member for CB9. I am the chair for Youth and Education. And what I'm asking for in, is an investment in the Soundview area for teens and young adults. We have a high crime rate. Um, there's not a lot of programming um, access for these teens and, and teens on, and youth on parole. They can't get jobs. They need training. They need OSHA, uh, GED. They need, need mental health services, things to get them back on their feet. And if we don't invest in this area, everybody has to be referred out. You know, we can get a family enrichment program. We have we we'll have resources and information, trainings, uh, whatever we need to build up these teens to make the time level go down, to keep them busy. Um, there's so much that can be done, but we have to invest in this community. So um, that's my testimony. If I could ask for money, I ask for two million. <laughs> Thank you for this time. Thank you so much, Monique. Um, uh, just echoing your sentiments, couldn't agree with you more on public safety and youth investment, for sure. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I see two more hands raised at this okay. time. Um, and we, nice name. Apologies right. if I'm butchering this pronunciation, but uh, Balt, Baldi, uh, B A L D E. Uh, you can unmute now. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hello. We can hear you. Yeah. Um. Good more. Um. Good afternoon. Now. Um. Thank you so much. Um. For having me to here today. Uh. First of all, I am. Blay Balde. I'm a member of Community Board One. Um. So I'm. I'm not here really. Um. To request something because it's my first time to attend this kind of meeting um but i'm thankful that i saw the email and outreach that uh, the new board of president was doing somewhere online so i did decide to join was as a community board when i am um, investing on immigrants and youth immigrant and also you know in safety so all organization that can support, um, you know, youth can should have, um, you know, funding and so support because, you know, our youth every day we see what's going on in the community. I think we should prioritize more on organization that can will that. In schools that are in our communities in community board one need more support. That and also, if there's a possibility to do, give other organizations that have, did not have chance 
to be here today to have opportunity to to put um a request for this funding and uh, it will be uh, a suggestion that i'm putting so for any other organization that have don't have a chance to come here today do they have a time to come and to put something so they can help their communities thank you Thank you so much, Baldi, for your um, testimony and for your advocacy on behalf yeah. of CBO. Would you mind letting me in on the, yeah, there we go. I think Maurice was Maurice. maybe. Yeah, do you want to? Un unmuted. Uh, I don't know if that was intended for us. I, okay. I'm going to guess no. Um, but do you see Joel Berg has a hand raised? Um, so. Joel, feel free to go ahead. And aside from Joel, I do not see any other hands raised at this point. Okay. Joel, you're all set. Oh, okay. Thank you so much, <laughs> and, and congratulations. Let me be the hundredth person to congratulate uh, the new borough president on this vital role. I will be uh, brief. Uh, as we know, food is the most basic of all needs, and despite the progress in the Bronx over the last few decades, Bronx remains New York City's hungriest borough. Hunger Free America found that one in four Bronx residents experience food insecurity, aren't always able to afford enough food. That includes 35.8% of all children, 18% of working adults, and 21% of older adults. By far, by far, the most effective way to fight hunger in the Bronx or New York City is to increase participation in the federal nutrition assistance safety net programs. Uh, when she was in the city council, uh, then councilwoman Gibson worked very closely with us to get funding from the city to do that work. As she's aware, we use that money to open up an office on Sheridan Avenue in the Bronx, our first ever field office, and we were doing absolutely vital work there. So I know everyone loves showering money on pantries and kitchens and food banks and food rescue groups, and they do vital work. But in terms of the most cost-effective way to fight this problem, every penny of city funds is matched by the federal government just for the outreach. And then every penny of the benefits funds is paid for by the federal government. And so every dollar Hunger Free America spends on city funds, on SNAP outreach, generates $60 of federal benefits to fill the grocery carts of low-income people. And that's just SNAP. The WIC program for pregnant women and children under five is really vital in the Bronx because there are no immigration restrictions on WIC the way they are on SNAP. And there are higher income limits on WIC, so lower middle class people as well as people in poverty can get WIC. We've asked for $600,000 from the city council to renew the funding that increase, that enabled us to open the Bronx office and dramatically expand uh, you know, our work in the Bronx and the rest of the city. So we hope we can count on your support to get the council to again renew that money. I can say that uh, Speaker Adams has talked about hunger as a top priority. Uh, Mayor Adams and his staff are very interested in expanding outreach. They understand that uh, helping people access these federally funded benefits paid by our very, very, very rich Uncle Sam are very critical strategies. So we hope we can have your support for that request, as well as our request to for $100,000 to expand our WIC work mm -hmm. in Bronx and elsewhere. Thank you so much. Joel, thank you so much. And thank you to Hunger Free America for, for the work that you all do tirelessly. Really appreciate your testimony. Thank you. All right, Deputy, I see two more hands have been raised in the last minute or so here. Uh, okay. Christina Stevens uh, is next. You should have the ability to unmute. Oh, thank you. I think you can hear me now. Good afternoon. Thank you for allowing us to join in. Congratulations again, Madam Vice, Madam President, and Audrey. Con um, sorry, Madam Vice President, Deputy Bow President. I met you at an event. I wanted to know, with all this proposed budget, how likelihood will the Bronx get the money the Bronx need for the Bronx to at least be 
in par with the rest of the, the other counties. I'm sorry, can you repeat that question, Christina? There are so many budgets, different um, affiliations, different entities, everybody looking to improve the Bronx. Right. How likelihood is this going to be possible to be approved? So the, these different entities can take care of the needs of the Bronx, especially the Van Ness neighborhood for senior citizens. That is absolutely a shame. Yeah, so we're going to work with our colleagues in government um, from city council uh, officials to our, our community boards to really understand and, and priorita uh, prioritize um, the requests and advocate um, for, for additional funding. We don't have clarity yet from the mayor's office, but we will continue to advocate and ensure that it is an equitable disbursement and the, the borough president is committed again to prioritize the needs of our Bronx residents. Thank you, Janet, and congratulations to you. Thank you so much, Ms. Stevens. All right, Deputy, I see one more hand. Dior um, should have the ability to unmute now. Good afternoon. I do not have any written testimony prepared, but I did want to amplify and highlight the necessity of sanitation being able to cover the expansions of curbside organics collection. As we know, the Bronx processes over 30% of the city's waste. And as we think about what it looks like to process locally, I just wanted to amplify the need um, for investment in the micro hauling industry that is coming up within New York City right now. The commercial waste zones are putting us in a space that allows us to be able to actually process that organic waste locally. So we need investment um, and also access to land that will allow us to be able to do that in a way that eliminates uh, the need for the truck traffic, but also eliminates the, the rodent population, maybe not eliminate, but uh, greatly and significantly reduces. Currently right now, sanitation, the way that they have um, decided who has access to this program is quite inequitable. And as we know with the Bronx having to handle so much of the ways it would be important to think about neighborhoods that have really high rodent populations to think about diverting this organic waste. So I have a worker owned cooperative Green Fiend Organics that operates out of a community garden in community board three. We essentially are here to uh, process the organic waste locally. So what we would like support with, I also chair the, the Bronx Swab, but what we would like support with is identifying a piece of land within the Bronx that we may be able to scale and invest in the infrastructure that allows us to process this organic waste locally so that it does not have to go out through transfer stations and to not have trucks going through the neighborhood. It's really about thinking about ways to have consolidation points that eliminates the need for some of these trucks in, in, in um, a lot of these neighborhoods. So I, it is not a direct ask uh, right now for a particular um, funding request, but I did want to take this time to kind of put some energy around the importance of thinking about climate mitigation um, and really uh, for, as a borough that we value, especially being the borough, that's the greenest borough. We have the most park space, Right. And if we're talking about um, taking care of the trees, then you're going to want this compost that we're making right out of these food scraps, which is very valuable resources. One of the things that we also do with the garden is we have a biogas machine and we, we taught our young people how to build it and how to also create renewable energy from these food scraps. So I think it's important to continue to invest in these programs. Yes, it seems like there's a question, um, but I think it's important to continue to invest in these programs, the work that we're doing. And I would love to just continue to build a relationship with the borough president's office um, in order to move forward. Um, a lot of a lot of the work that we've been doing. Definitely, Dior. Uh, thank you so much for your testimony. I know um, during the last administration, um, these discretionary funds were drastically cut. Um, and to your point, it is a, a huge necessity. And, and even when we look at the distribution citywide, um, the Bronx was uh, not considered. Uh, in comparison to, to other boroughs. And so I, I agree with you. Um, on the piece on identifying land, is that for the local composting operations? Yes. Is that what, okay. Okay. If, if you can reach out to our offices and we'll love to make the connection. And Thank you. I see that there is a question from Bernadette. I apologize. It is not a question um, uh, with what, what was just presented. I did want to add something after all the speakers. 
are done. So if that could do that, thank you. Sure, yeah, I don't see any other hands raised, so uh, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I, I wanted to just elaborate on just quickly to just to point out that the East Bronx, which are the communities of Yanis, Pelham Parkway and Mars Park have been vibrant communities and brother sister communities for decades and decades and our resources are very depleted. That's why our children are important and a community center with just uh, with after school programs with so much would would help our community in so many different ways um, to to really bring some resources to our to our community when it comes to our children. Um, and the ask right now, while I don't have a money ask, um, if the ask of uh, an example of the Kips Bay Boys and Girls Club, something like that within our one of our those three communities would help more than one community as far as a money ask. And right now there is property available. We don't want those properties to go into developers for something else. We want it to go into the most needed resources that we've been asking for for decades. Um, and that is just something I want to put on the record. So thank you. Thank you so much, Bernadette. Really appreciate your testimony. All Is right, Jeffrey, I okay. do not see any more hands. Great. Once again, thank you all so much. Thank you to the organizations that provided testimony that are uh, tirelessly advocating for additional and, and necessary resources. I know that the Bronx Borough President will be a strong advocate um, in, in terms of ensuring that we get the funding that we need um, for our beloved borough. Thank you all so much for listening, for tuning in. Um, for participating. And again, just a quick reminder, our next borough board uh, meeting will be scheduled for March 17th. Uh, this will be via WebEx, um, but if there are any changes in the coming future, we will notify you. Thank you again and have a lovely and grateful weekend. Bye everyone, be well. You too, thank you.